Hello everyone, I'm Professor Paul Carrier of the Western Michigan University Thomas M. Cooley Law School and I'd like to provide some information with regard to the materials assigned for the Contracts 1 class, uh, class number 2. And so remember last time we talked a little bit about what Contracts 1 and 2 entails over the course of two different terms. We talked about the importance of trying to stay within each category and understanding what is the category and what fits within it and not leaving that category unless and until there's a good reason to do so. Uh, we also talked about the first component of formation. We are in formation for the few, first few weeks of Contracts 1. You need an offer, and as you recall, the offer had the current intent. It had to be communicated to the other party who might be able to accept it, and um, there had to be certain specificity of details to make sure that there was enough information for someone else to accept. Um, we also discussed a few things that were not intents to offer. Typically, for example, advertisements are usually offers or invitations to enter into negotiations and not offers. There are some others as well, so keep in mind factual scenarios where there may be a problem of the current intent, social contracts being another example. Today, however, we're moving into the second component, or acceptance. And one of the, the overarching things to remember with regard to acceptance is that the offer or is the master of the offer. And so, where the offeror makes clear how an acceptance needs to be made, then that has to be strictly adhered to by an offeree. For example, if the offeror says, I must receive your acceptance by Friday before noon, there is no other option. If it's clear, it's the way the offeror states it. Period. If it's not so clear, then there's a little bit of wiggle room in acting reasonably. If the offeror says, I need your answer as soon as possible, two or three days might be fine. Uh, in the, today's world of telecommunications, maybe within 24 hours, one business day might be the case. Uh, better when it's completely specified and there are no questions, but if it's not specified so clearly, we have to look at the facts and circumstances and determine what is reasonable. Okay? Uh, there, the offeree, of course, has to know about the offer. So if he or she does something or is not made aware of, of some particular term, he or she is, would not be found to have accepted it. And we see that in the cartoon Monahan case, which we will cover uh, in class. Another thing, we also see the changing perception of what constitutes an acceptance based on the realities of changes in the world. Now that we have internet, now that we can toggle I agree, I accept the terms, the manner of acceptance is changing from the old common law to accommodate new technologies, new expectations. And we see that in that case involving the terms of arbitration that are contained in shrink wrap on a computer product. Uh, there's one case in particular dealing with the, that old gentleman who was uh, ne nearing the end of his, his, his existence on this earth, and he wrote to have his niece and I believe her husband come to visit him. Uh, you need to ask yourself, in all cases when you see an offer, and this goes back to what the offeror expects, is the offeror expecting performance only? That we call a unilateral contract. And your promise to finish the job is no good. You simply do it and get paid, or you don't do it and you don't get paid. And that may be what the offeror expects. The offeror, on the other hand, might want you to promise, I need you to paint my garage quickly within a week because it's important it's painted within a week. Do you promise you'll be able to get it done by the end of this week? or next week, whatever the time frame would be. Now I'm not just asking, or the offeror in that case, is not just asking for paint or painting. He or she's asking that you obligate yourself to do it properly. And when you promise to do it and do it properly, you now can be sued for breach if you fail. Okay? So the distinction between unilateral, where you can walk away, and bilateral, where you can't walk away without committing breach unless you fully comply, 
that's a very big distinction to make, and it determines significant rights and duties between the parties. And that's why you always want to be asking yourself whether the offeror is demanding unilateral performance or bilateral return promise as well as performance. Uh, there's another trick with the beard implements case that I'd like to warn you about. There's some material, I forget which page it is in the book, but it mentions uh, somewhat carefully, in fact, I think I should probably find that for you. Give me just a few seconds to find this because I'd like to point out one of the one of the, one of the areas that, that will be helpful because the case, to many, they find it that it's uh, somewhat complicated and it's really not so bad as you think. If you take a look at page 76, a paragraph that begins, in deciding whether you're the offer, one of the tricks in that case is we have somebody who puts out information about buying farm equipment. Is that an offer? Allowing the other side who receives it to accept. Or is it an invitation to enter into negotiations? What do you think about buying my farm equipment? It's not an offer, but let's talk. Then the other side comes back and says, I like it, I can afford $58,000 with the trade-in, and I'll take it. Well, that person might be thinking that he or she's accepting the deal. But in fact, we have flip-flopped who the offeror is. If I invite you to initiate negotiations, and you come back with a current intent to purchase, right? it's not me offering to sell, it's you offering to buy from me. And so I have set it up in a way, under that, those circumstances, to be the offeree who has the power to accept or not to accept. You are the offeror, and I have to listen to you. But if you offer to me and I say nothing, you have never accepted, we have no bargain. And that's a good technique for somebody in the position of selling something to avoid binding liability uh, because he or she makes the other side come up with the offer. And that's what happens in that implements case. Uh, and so if you don't get your minds around that, I, I find the case to be simply confusing. And so keep in mind, and I pointed out the sentence where that's discussed by some experts uh, in a horn book that, I, in fact, I used when I was in law school. Uh, moving on, uh, when you are dealing with the sale of goods, it's a contract with sale of goods. Sale of goods, you know that you're supposed to be in the Uniform Commercial Code. There is a section on formation, UCC Article 2-204. And what it says in brief is that there is some flexibility in how contracts are made. You talk a little, I talk a little, we send an email, you send an email, there's a phone call, there's a phone message, and we may be able to concoct the entire agreement between those various communications. It's not simply, here's my paper of offer, there is your paper of acceptance, mm, hey, we've got a deal. There may be a little bit more flexibility. It doesn't have to be that stiff, particularly when we're talking about sale of goods and people in the commercial system not in the common law, but in the commercial system with merchants, etc., etc. Okay? There's a mention of when a contract is formed, the timing, because the exact moment of formation begins to control the rights and duties between the parties. And what the UCC says is, unless it's clear, clearly set out otherwise and required by the offeror, basically, the timing can be flexible. Between these four days, as we talk back and forth and email back and forth, and in a conglomerate way, we had a deal, and we're not sure if it was day one or day four, but we know that within that period, by the end of day four, we had a deal. Okay? Uh, the offeror as master of the offer can demand how the offeree could accept an order. You have to inform me in writing in my hand by Tuesday whether or not you accept. If it's that clear, that has to be done. And we'll learn at some point about a common law mirror image rule. So you might want to write down mirror image rule. We will try to talk about that at some point. If not in this class, then in next week's. Uh, but if it's not specified how acceptance must be done, then the idea is that it should be allowed in any reasonable manner. Could I send a mail back to you? Could I send a telephone type, a fax, an email? Can I send my mm, junior associate over with it in his hand to shake hands and make the agreement? And all of those should be fine based on the facts and circumstances.
Okay? And in fact, we're going to learn with regard to uh, restatement of contract section 69. Even silence in certain cases can be acceptance. So acceptance might be a phone call. Acceptance might be return mail. Acceptance might be FedEx mail. Acceptance might be hiring the Goodyear blimp and putting I accept Ed on the Goodyear blimp to fly around a stadium in Dallas if that's what the offeror requires. Other than that, reasonable under the circumstances, but also with an idea that unless it's completely crazy, it still should be in the way that the offeror expects. Because remember, the offeror is the master of the offer. And in fact, I have basically trademarked or copyrighted a new word, and I call it master roar. When you think master roar, you're thinking offeror is master of the offer. So in appropriate circumstances on my exams, you can say master roar, and I will take that word master roar to mean the idea that you get an offeror who is the master of the offer, who controls the offer, and how it may be accepted. Okay? So if you'd like to use that word, that's certainly fine. There has to be knowledge of the offer. You can't accept something that you don't know about. And even though somehow you say you want something, it's not really the reply. It's not an acceptance to an offer if the offer was not yet communicated to you. And uh, is that a huge point? Probably the subject more of uh, a medium difficulty multiple choice question. Okay, let me end with uh, talking about whether there are elements to acceptance. As you recall, with the offer, the elements to offer were a current intent, has to be communicated somehow to the other parties who may or may not accept, and there has to be reasonable specificity of terms without a lot of glitches, holes, or blanks. If there are a lot of blanks or holes in a deal, it's probably an invitation to negotiate and not a currently intended offer. Not yet. Okay? Uh, well, there has to be a current intent to accept. You have to indicate as an offeree, I accept, I agree, let me think about it for a week, it's not an acceptance. We will talk a little bit about option contracts for next week, but a typical offer, if I say let me think about it, then that's not an acceptance yet. And that leaves me, as an offeror, the right to sell to anyone else. So if you want a week to think about it, and I sell it tomorrow, you come back and sue me and say, wait, I said I was thinking about it. You have to give me time. And I say to you, that wasn't our deal. I made an offer. You said, I don't know yet. And in the interim, because there, it was not an option contract, we will explain that, uh, I was able to sell it to anyone else unless and until you had come back and accepted in time. You haven't done that yet, so my power of making offers to other parties is still there, and I have the ability to do that because you have not bound me with a current intent. Uh, the intent to accept also needs to be communicated. The offeree has to inform the offeror in the manner expected that he or she agrees. Otherwise, we don't have a uh, a formed contract at that point. Again, if the offeror doesn't express exactly how to accept, then it should be in any manner reasonable under the circumstances. Okay? Um, and so that coincides as well with the offer having to be communicated to uh, offerees. So the offeree's intent to accept also has to be communicated. In one of the classes that com that's coming up, we will talk about the mailbox rule and it deals with some of the timing problems that can occur between the time that I've made an offer right, and the time that uh, you send back the acceptance and whether or not in that interim period between my giving it to you and your return, I am stuck to leave it open or I'm able to actually turn it over. I can make the offer to other people awaiting word from you. And we do have a default rule that we call the mailbox rule which we will talk about later. And if I remember correctly, it's in the restatements somewhere in the 40s, 42, 43, 44, 45. Uh, but we will cover it again. In the offer, we also had a third element, certain specificity of terms. Does acceptance have a correlative element? And the answer, as you might expect, is yes. It has to be responsive. It has to take much or most of the parts of what the offer required and meet them, saying, yes, I agree to this, 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 and this. When we have that, we have an acceptance, and that part of formation is taken care of. 